You've probably heard me say on a number of occasions that I think Two Die Twenty system is unique among role-playing games, and one of the reasons for that is because the game master is called upon to operate a set of mechanics to essentially be one of the players at the table. The set of mechanics that the game master has available to him is different. It's an asymmetric game where there's a different set of tools, but I wouldn't mistake it for a story game or something of the like, like Power by the Apocalypse games. Instead, 2 Die 20 is about heroic genre role-playing, or genre simulation, which is a, a word or a term that I picked up from Runeslinger. And as the kind of tabletop role-playing that 2 Die 20 system envisions is something that we're all new to, including the authors of the books, I think it can be a little difficult to wrap your head around what's going on in there. It's not particularly complex, the mechanics are easy to operate and play, and they sort of see a very cool agenda realized once you get going. But nevertheless, I think that it's worth talking about from my perspective as someone who's run about 15 sessions now. And so this is going to be the start of a journey, a tutorial, if you will, a teaching about GMing in 2 Die 20 system. The most unique mechanic is that Player risk-taking and changes in the environment and NPC activity, they all relate to this thing called the Doom Pool, which is a set of tokens that the Game Master has at the beginning of the session and gets from player actions and spends to make things happen. I'm going to cut right into it. We have a very long thought bubble, which is going to explain everything and go into depth. So let's let the words do the talking. I'm the Complex Games Apologist. So without further ado, let's get started here with a very brief one minute explanation and overview of what Doom is in these games. It's called different things in the different games. In Infinity, it's called Heat, and in Star Trek Adventures, it's called Threat. But in every case, it's a set of tokens that the Game Master receives, both at the start of each session and from the risks and complications that come up as the players go about their business. In each of the games, the primary function of this pool of tokens is to power NPC die rolls by allowing them to roll more than two die 20 as their rolls, and thus achieve higher difficulties and higher margins of success. And for that same reason, when NPCs achieve higher margins of success and bank those margins in the same way as players do with momentum, those margins become doom tokens that are in the pool. The secondary application of Doom tokens and how they're spent by the Game Master is for sudden changes to the scene, to things like reinforcements arriving, or traps, or things like the vines snapping on a bridge in the middle of the jungle, or the sudden betrayal of an erstwhile ally. For a more involved overview of what's going on at the core of the die rolling engine in 2 Die 20 system games, take a look at this video right here. Now there are a lot of critics of this mechanic who will tell you that it restricts Game Master activity, that it constricts what the Game Master can do in any given moment because he has to have these tokens in order to make them happen. And so it's seen as circumscribing Game Master creativity and spontaneity. So now that we've done that brief recap of what Doom is and that we know what the haters are saying, let's get in deep with what's really going on with this mechanic. Let's talk about where it comes from, how you spend it, and how the game instructs you to spend it. Our future depends powerfully on how well we understand this cosmos. So we know what some folks say about Doom, but what does Doom say about itself in the games? If I had to pick one line from all the rulebooks for 2 Die 20 system games, I would look to the Conan rulebook where it says, Doom is a means of building tension. Doom mimics the increasing tension that builds over the course of a Conan story. And I think if we start from this point, that Doom is a means to an end to serve the genre that the game wants to embody, then I think we also get a lot of insight into what the Game Master's role and purpose at the table is, both from an introspective view of who am I, and also who am I to the table and to these other players. So let's hear a little bit more from Conan about what Doom is. In the setting, Doom is an abstract thing, but something ever-present in the minds of those caught up in the intrigue and danger of the Hyborian Age. Doom is everything that could go wrong, every problem that could arise, the pressure applied by the conspiracies of evildoers and the machinations of malevolent gods, and represented in the power of foul sorcerers and vile abominations. It is seeped into the earth, while at times the universe seems a vast and indifferent place, it inevitably reeks of evil. An abundance of doom makes the situation a dangerous one, not because of the visible dangers, but from the unseen perils and the new problems that will crop up. 
So let's put a pin in that last little bit about the unseen dangers, because I think that's a really important observation about what Doom's purpose is. It's for the gotchas, it's for the shockers, it's for the twists and turns in a story. Now the flavor of that description was a little bit grim, owing to the flavor of REH's fiction that Conan comes from. So let's hear a little bit more of an optimistic version of this through the lens of Star Trek Adventures. Threat really comes into its own when it is used as a creative tool to completely change the circumstances the player characters find themselves in. From plot twists to unexpected events, threat can be used to create a shift in a dramatic conflict. You could spend the threat to make five more Klingon warriors come around the corner, but what if you spent that same five threat to cause the alarm klaxons to sound? Self-destruct sequence initiated. Silent countdown begins now. Okay, so we've heard from the games themselves what they see their currency for the Game Master as. Now, it would be easy to mistake this idea of spending doom for gotchas and surprises and the like. As a concept of permission, I think at least some of the haters are under the impression that you can't do something like spring a trap without access to threat or doom. And I want to take a moment right now to correct the record on that. The answer is no, you can absolutely do those things. And the answer to how is tied up with the idea of the scene frame. And a little bit further down the line in this video, we will be getting into some detail and some strategies for framing scenes. But for now, let's get down to nuts and bolts and hear from the Conan rulebook about one of the two primary ways that the Game Master will be spending Doom. <clears throat> As Doom represents the amount of pressure that player characters apply to a situation, it also provides the means for non-player characters to push back so that situations remain challenging and their plans can adapt to the players. The number one example of how NPCs do push back on the situation is by buying themselves their own dice with the Create Opportunity Spend. Another one of the really fun and more organic uses of Doom is when NPCs call for reinforcements. In Star Trek Adventures, you might imagine that a Klingon would pull out his communicator and ask for an additional landing party to beam down. With the momentum that instantly becomes threat from that communications check, the Game Master could then spend the threat in order for additional minor NPCs to be added to a combat. And finally, because 2 Die 20 system wants to let the Game Master remain flexible with introducing new NPCs, and so doesn't have individual tracking of things like fortune points or ammunition for NPCs, instead, equivalent effects are purchased with Doom. So that's how NPCs use Doom as their own parallel version of momentum. One thing to point out here is that major NPCs or nemesis level opponents in Conan don't actually get summoned into scenes. They have to logically be a part of a scene in order to come in. And so they're not reinforcements. They're what the thing's all about. Another thing to take away here is that phrase, so that situations remain challenging. To me, that's kind of a byword for 2 Die 20s genre sauce. It's the idea that as the heroes are the center of the story, it's going to be exciting, just as a given. And so part of that is that Doom is going to be around and at the disposal of the NPCs, because they're not a pushover, or they wouldn't be on camera. So let's move on to an overview of some of the ways of spending Threat or Doom as the Game Master to reflect changes in the environment and to bring about complications and uh, things going foobar unexpectedly. When it comes to environmental Doom spends or ambient things like the strap on a backpack breaking or a bowstring snapping at an inopportune moment, the thing to keep in mind is that a complication, which players will roll normally as a part of a task when they roll a 20 in Conan or in Star Trek Adventures, those complications can also be bought with the Game Master for two threat or doom. And one of the core aspects of the player-facing side of tasks is that players can add two to threat or doom in order to pass up a complication and kind of push it into the background as a looming danger. So something like unstable footing that affects one character just momentarily will probably cost something like two doom, which is also the same cost as create problem, which is how you can momentarily escalate the difficulty of tasks with just sort of things like the sun in your eye, for example. And one thing to keep in mind here is that this isn't about a competitive spirit of trying to make the players fail, and Conan goes out of its way to spell this out over and over again. I'd like to go back to that idea of, so the situation remains challenging. There's an assumption here that what we're dealing with, what's on scene right now, is the momentous parts of the story, not security camera footage, and not a documentary. A heroic story. 
Each point of threat or doom could also be thought of as one die or challenge die of damage from unexpected circumstances like a lava tube bursting or the like. Now there are a couple of special case spends for doom and threat. One of them in Conan is the idea of splitting the party with a sudden door slamming shut on them or the like, and that costs one for each player in the larger group. Star Trek Adventures has a special mechanic called a reversal. And by spending two threat for each player character that's already in the scene, the game master can say that circumstances just took a turn and went out of control too many Klingon reinforcements are showing up, or the briefing that the players are sitting on in, in the observation lounge is suddenly concluded when there's a report that there's a boarding party aboard the ship. And I think that's fitting with the television genre emulation aspects of Star Trek Adventures, but maybe less so for the other 2 die 20 games. These special Doom spends that are in one game but not in another, I think are something to look out for and to identify as elements of the genre of game that you are playing in 2 die 20 Now the presence of these spends in the game does seem to speak towards the idea that the Game Master does have strictures on how much permission he has to do these things. But you do have permission to do these things because there's a starting pool of Doom or Threat in Conan. You get one Doom at the start of every session for every fortune point that the player characters start with on their character sheets. And in Star Trek Adventures, you start with two Threat for every player character that's at the table with you. And to me, those numbers embody a little bit of what the genre substance of these games are. For Conan, that could mean a toughened opponent showing up preempting initiative and buying a few extra dice to suddenly ambush the player characters. But that would be all of it if it were suddenly spent at once. Like Ice with Star Trek Adventures, you could have a peace negotiation going on. The player characters think that they're working on that, but suddenly there's a Klingon or Romulan assault that brings it to an abrupt halt. And that could be a reversal, but you only have one of those on the table because the story is ultimately about the heroes. Now, in the course of a session, many more of these sudden twists of fate could occur. Many more moments of really hard push and sweat and vigor coming from NPCs trying to lean in and defeat the heroes could happen. But the idea is that that's linked to the risk-taking and the actions of the player characters after that, because they are the center of the gravity of the game that you're playing. So if you want to play a game where the characters are the center of the story, then you absolutely have permission to introduce the sort of elements that will lead to a challenging transcript of your sessions, which might be remembered as an exciting story. So that's a set of comparisons or yardsticks for what a given point of doom can do in your pool. Now you can do anything because it's a creative tool as the game master. It can really sculpt what's happening in play. And it's a way for the players to get a sense of how what they've done is connected to what is happening to them. Because it is the story of the players. Now there's one more yardstick or comparison for what Doom can do at the table. And that's a time cost and opportunity cost. Clearing a complication in Star Trek Adventures is normally a difficulty two task that takes one task to accomplish. In combat, a character has one task on their turn, unless they take some risks. And in this light, two points of doom or threat can be seen as an action tax, or as an obstacle that will take that long to overcome. And one point of doom or threat, as noted in the Coleman rulebook, is something which is just a momentary complication. It's something like sweat running down your brow. It takes only a minor action in combat to get out of the way. Or it could be something that's distracting. It could be a door creaking or sort of a, a curtain moving in your peripheral vision that distracts you, if only for a moment. And I think that these are really important ways to think about doom and threat because uh, when you have a lot of it, and it's, it's really there to create challenge, not to kill the players. Uh, the, these sort of little things that will take time rather than increase danger are, are something to, to consider. And with that in mind, one of the observations from actual play that I've heard about in 2 die 20 system is Game Masters having too much doom. I think one of the ways to get over that hill is to anticipate when you're going to see a lot of it 
when it's going to rush in your direction because then you can sort of spend it down and continue to keep the situation exciting and challenging and having the NPCs pushing back. And so the next segment is about anticipating when you're going to get a lot of doom and where that's going to come from. So besides the starting pool at the beginning of each session and things like passing on complications to add to the pool, there's essentially two ways that you get Doom during the course of play. The first of which is what you call immediate spends, which are players buying things with momentum that they don't have. In other words, taking risks. So let's get under the hood with these. You already know the chief offender here, which is create opportunity, the player's way of buying more dice, which can often generate them momentum on the other side, because some things aren't immediate spends, and so the players will need to kind of take out a mortgage sometimes. It's an interesting property that I think it affects timing, so I, I do mention it here. The number two source of doom in Conan is not properly an immediate spend, because it must be purchased with doom, and that's reactions parries and reposts and the like. But in Star Trek Adventures, where there aren't reactions because hand-to-hand -hand combat isn't that granular, instead additional minor actions seems to be the biggest source of threat. And that's the players taking an extra action to move and aim their weapon and draw their phaser and activate their comm badge. Now the next most common immediate spend that you will see happening is the swift task. And this is in both games, costs two, and allows a character to do two tasks in the space of one turn. This could be in an out of combat perspective as well. Moving down to a third tier of immediate spends and sources of threat or doom, there's a whole basket of little things like voluntary failures that the players may make on tasks in Conan in order to regain fortune, add one point of doom, lethal attacks in Star Trek Adventures, add one point of threat, and likewise consume one point of threat when NPCs make them. That's part of the sort of punch above the belt ethos of the television genre that it's seeking to emulate. At this point, we're starting to get a little bit down into the weeds when it comes to immediate spends. It's not that they don't happen, it's just that they happen less and they're starting to get a little bit more particular and less frequent. Things like the player's being indecisive at the start of combat and Conan will lead to one point of doom being added. Star Trek equipment can be pulled out of your handbag as an immediate spend. Uh, just sort of like, I had this all along. But as far as sources of the pools and places where a surge may happen and being attentive to, anticipating, and riding the wave of those surges... At this point, we're really overshadowing NPCs generating their own doom or threat by banking success, which doesn't actually happen all that often because NPCs tend to leave or sort of blow themselves like a glass cannon in order to make an impact in the scene. So let's move on to the other noteworthy source of threat or doom, and that is from changes in the circumstance. If there's a beat in the music or other suspenseful moment, if the players kick open the door into a dungeon where things really escalate in terms of danger, or if suddenly there's a really frightening or formidable monster, like, uh, you know, a demon, then that will be reflected in, in addition to the pool. In Conan, in the case of creatures, this is called Doom Herald, and in Star Trek Adventures, it's called Menacing. There's one oddball thing in Star Trek Adventures that I think really upholds genre that I think belongs here, and that is NPC values. When they get challenged, that adds three to threat. When an NPC is taken out of their element, when you convince a Klingon that it is not a good day to die today, then that adds unpredictability and uncertainty to the circumstances. That places things on unstable footing, which is the meaning of threat. So at this point, I hope that we have a bird's eye view of what it looks like in the Game Master's chair. The reasons that the system has you spending threat and doom is to continue to uphold that genre feeling, that the environment is pushing back, that things are building to a climax, and that it is a challenging and heroic story, which means that the opposition and the obstacles are not trivial, and that the risks are really brought about by the actions that the players do themselves. It's all about interconnectivity. So with that understood, let's look at the common problem of too much doom, or the perception that doom is a competitive instrument. It's sort of the devil on the game master's shoulder. 
One of the things to keep in mind is the quantum levels of doom and threat. And by that I mean, what does it take for a certain thing to happen? For doom is about where a trap can be sprung that will create meaningful danger for a character. So if there's fewer than four doom, then that means that there's probably not going to be a bear trap kind of just suddenly on the floor, as happens in some Conan stories. And two times the number of players, which could be six or eight threat, is where a reversal can happen. So things aren't going to turn around just on a dime for you as your character if you're under that threshold. Likewise, as a game master, if you want to reassure the players that this course of action is one that they should keep going on or that is worthy of pursuing, that is a fun place for everyone to be playing, then, you know, spend so that it stays under that threshold or, you know, just keep that in mind, be aware of it. Another threshold is one for ambushes. A notable NPC in Conan, plus maybe two guys in his squad, will cost four, and then preempting initiative will cost another one, and then to really make the attack meaningful, he might likely have to buy an additional two dice. That's about six to kind of suddenly start a combat in the middle of a scene in Conan. And in my experience of play, one of the fun things is that you may be looking to hit these thresholds because of pacing or because you can sort of reveal some of the elements of the environment that the players are in once they reach these. So just like in a board game or in a card game, when you're looking at what's in your hand, but you're not ready to enact a plan, this can be a way, looking at your pool of tokens, to start thinking about places where the environment or the NPCs will move and react. And this is really fun because it makes me more proactive as a game master, and it makes me think about how to portray challenging environments and just a challenging story. Because often I'm kind of listening and listening and listening, and the players are doing and doing and doing. And the feeling that I'm playing too is really there and that I'm interacting. And another element of this is that I, I really wouldn't want to betray that by bringing things to a grinding halt, by encouraging paranoia. So I think that as your group uh, is beginning play, especially if you've played a lot of challenge-based D&D, &D, I would encourage you to spend Doom pretty frequently and keep, keep the pool relatively low to abate some of that paranoia. And you may see it happening that the players uh, won't actually you know, do many immediate spends at all um, unless the difficulty pressure is on them. And we'll talk about task difficulties and that sort of thing in a future video in this series. And if that's the case, if you're looking to hit those thresholds where kind of sudden things can happen, one thing to keep in mind is that complications can be turned into two doom as the game master. So if a player rolls a complication, sometimes I will pass on that in order to build the pool up to the point where it does feel like something looming and worthy of consideration. So let's consider a situation where you have way too much uh, doom in the pool as the game master. As kind of a final note, this is a comment that I got on my first video about 2 die 20 in general. And in this situation, you know, if one of the players is injured and they're fighting through a, a scene, one of the things I would do is make use of those minor complications, things like sweat on the brow and so on, that will consume additional minor actions. If the player chooses to clear those by taking additional minor actions, it's a drop in the bucket. It's just one back into the pool. And also, another thing that I would think about is creating complications that are a little bit tangential. Uh, things like the strap or the, the leather wrap on a sword uh, needing to be rewound means that the character will have to change weapons. But even in the middle of a combat, this isn't particularly obtrusive, and it'll just add sort of more flavor and color. Likewise, uh, you know, falling prone is the sort of consequence that could come from a complication or a doom spend, uh, maybe made uh, during or after a sprint. And that's fine, because that's, that's just, it's a little action tax. In this case, the doom turned into a little bit of time that it took, 
Maybe that character sprinting across a field is spotted by some of the, the Lord's henchmen as the players are sneaking towards uh, a place where captives are being held. And so now they know that the alarm will be raised when they arrive. It doesn't really strongly affect the combat one way or another. Another technique uh, is with reinforcements. You can spend for reinforcements, but the text for that is explicit that you got to wait until the beginning of next round for them to arrive. And with that in mind, those guys arriving in the next round will watch the player characters act first, because in Conan, the characters do go first, and they might be so terrified by the fearsomeness of these protagonists that they might flee in the same breath. But what we've done is we've established the numbers that the characters are up against. We've established more about where the bad guys are coming from. And we've heightened the tension because there's that many folks in there. And even if a minor NPC shows up and kind of brandishes his spear only to flee, surrender, or the player continues on his way, that's still a good spend of doom, especially in these situations where you're flush with it. A fun little anecdote from my last session of Star Trek Adventures. I was getting a lot of threat from a very risk-prone player character who's a lot of fun to play with. And things happened in such a way that he blundered into one of the opponents that he was chasing in a Jeffrey's tube. And he tried to make a diplomatic overture to him. And the fun thing that I ended up doing is I had friendly NPCs capture that quarry. And so the players would have to kind of negotiate and be obvious to those friendly NPCs if they were going to try and pursue their agenda. So it was a reversal where they ended up in the brig and an NPC captain was congratulating the PC, but it was a reversal nonetheless because things went sideways. It was sort of success and failure at once. That's the sort of thing that creates tension and ramps up the story. It's a heroic and challenging story, after all. And that's the moral of the story with Doom. I think that reading the book and really reading the intention, and then looking at the mechanics through that light and experiencing them for yourself is a great thrill, and it's also the way to kind of unravel this Gordian knot of what's going on with 2 Die 20. In the next video, I'll talk about the scene frame, setting scenes, and what that means to the game what it means to start in the middle of a combat, what it means to start in the middle of a journey, what it means to start at the beginning, and sort of where to call the end to a scene, which is something that I've had to learn for myself because I've gotten ahead of myself or I've let it drag for too long. And I do think it's crucial to what 2 Day 20 is. Later on, we'll talk about task difficulties and setting tasks and how much fun that is and also how much it interacts with the other components of the system. I hope that you join me for the rest of this series on the Complex Games Apologist. Have a great time and happy gaming.